one of the things that as a church we're passionate about is church planting. And Arthur Bean is, is a church planter. He started a church this, this past year. It's in Forest City. How many people know where Forest City is? Okay. If you go west, and it is on the way to the mountains, it is actually it's his hometown. He has quite the testimony. He came here on a Wednesday night and shared how he was deep into drugs and dealing and almost died and came to Christ. And now he is reaching people who are in that same group, those who are drug addicts and alcoholics and and he is working with God's grace to start a church in an area that desperately needs the gospel. We're going to show a little clip of this. It's of his church. It's called Fountain Baptist Church in Forest City. Good morning, Villas Chapel. Arthur Bien, pastor of Fountain Baptist Church here. Thank you so much for choosing us as your For the City project in the month of May. We ask that you continue to pray for us as we engage our community in loving service and share the gospel and seek to see no place left where the name of Jesus Christ has not been made known. We're thankful for you, and we're praying for you as well. God bless. So we give as a church, we give about $2,400 a year to them. And if you feel led to say, you know what, I want to be giving beyond that. There's ways to contact him. There's cards back on our mission board. You could pick that up and say, hey, I want to support him beyond what our church does. One of the things that my wife and I did is when he was getting ready to start his church, we were out in the mountains up there, and I called him up. I said, hey, what are you doing? It was Monday night. I said, what are you doing? He said, yeah, just hanging out with the family. I said, how about if we meet you, you and your wife, and we'll take you to, to dinner, and you show us the town. It was pretty cool took us around there. So maybe if you're out that way and you have his number, you could surprise him and say, hey, we want to take you out to dinner and, and treat you because think about what he's doing. This is a huge undertaking. It really is. Today's message really is called Mountain Moving Faith. And when you think about what he's doing, starting a church, that takes a lot of faith. And I want you to think about your own life. I want you to think about your life and how you can make Jesus famous through your faith. Maybe there's a mountain in your life you're going, this is huge. I really need God's help with this. This is huge. We're talking about church culture. And when you think about culture in like business culture, they talk about culture of the office, and sometimes it's a good culture, sometimes it's not so good. And the same can be true of churches. Churches can have a really good culture, sometimes it's not so good. I believe this church right here is a loving, caring church. We take care of people who come in, visitors. We have a passion for the community, but you know what? We can do better. We can always do better. And so we're doing this series on Second Peter and we're going to be looking at the different characteristics that God has placed in his word about us as a church. And it's really like a DNA. What should be true of us so we know how to relate better to those people outside? When you think about mountain-moving faith, Jesus actually said, if you have faith the size of what? A mustard seed. Isn't that not crazy? We'll get into that in a little bit. If you have that kind of faith, that small faith, you can see something huge in your life get moved. That's crazy. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. We're not covering all these verses, but I want you to get the context, get the context of, of each of the words. And today's word is really going to be faith, but I want you to see this. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 9. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, 
forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. We're going to focus, of course, on faith. Now, if you think about the word faith, faith is used many different times in the whole Bible, but we're going to look at primarily in the New Testament, but it's used in many different ways. And so the context is really important to understand the way the word is used. For instance, if you use the word, let's just, I'll throw a word out at you, run, are you in? I'm going to run to the store. In your mind, you don't see me get on my running shoes and run to the store, get my groceries, and run home, right? I'm just jumping in my truck, and I'm riding to the store, and I'm getting my groceries and coming back. What are other ways people can use the word run? Oh, boy, you're making you think. What's that? Okay, run for office. What else? Running off at the mouth. When we were kids, man, I don't think I ever did this. People would call somebody's house and say, is your refrigerator running? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Better catch it before it runs out the door. This past week, on Wednesday, the neighbor was so kind to say, hey, your garage door is open and it's like 1030. And I'm like, I thought I shut that. And there's an alarm going off. The hot water tank went. And so it sets off an alarm, opens the door, so if it blows up, you know, it doesn't kill everybody. <laughs> so Wednesday to Friday, we, our hot water tank was not running. Yes. Finally, I got tired of waiting, and I said, I'm going to fix it myself. I got the parts. My wife ordered the parts, got the parts, got instruction from my nephew who's a plumber in another state. I was tired of waiting because the plumbers were very busy. I said, we need hot water. So walk me through it. I'm still alive. Didn't electrocute myself, but it's a good thing. But when you think about this, there's different kinds of faith mentioned in the scriptures, and we're going to look at some of those. One is intellectual faith. One is intellectual faith. When you think of the word intellectual faith, think of something that has to do with what you know. Facts. Facts. Jaden, can I help you? Can I help you with something there? Do I look tired or something? What? Do I need some rest? Okay. Well, thank you. When you think about intellectual faith, this is the way people approach Jesus. Think of this, think of this chair, right? Jesus, people know the facts about Jesus. They know that he came from heaven to earth, that he lived the perfect life, that he died on the cross and rose again, and they know it. Just like I'm looking at this chair right here going, I know that could hold me up, but I'm not sure I really want to sit in that right now. And that's the way people approach Jesus. They look at it and they go, I have this knowledge of him, just like they do about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, and it's up here. It hasn't settled in their heart. 81% of Americans say they believe in God. That's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. But that won't save them. That won't save them. Okay, who needs to silence their phone? <laughs> All right, in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, it tells us about a guy named Cornelius who believed in his head about God, but it wasn't enough. Let me read this to you in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. At Caesarea, which is north of Jerusalem, quite a ways north along the Mediterranean, northern tip of the, the, the country of Israel, there was a man named Cornelius the Centurion in, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He was, he was part of the Roman army. A centurion was in charge of 80 to 100 soldiers. He was part of the Italian Regiment that came from Italy, and they were police keeping. They were watching over the, the country, making sure there weren't riots. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, if he was saved, God would not have sent Peter all the way up from where he was in Joppa to Caesarea and preached the gospel to him and his family and many, many others. He had an intellectual faith that needed to become a true saving faith, but he wasn't there yet. 
You can read about it in Acts chapter 10. Peter went and shared the gospel with him. Listen to what James chapter 2, verse 19 says. James is challenging people who are the audience of his letter. He says, and he's mostly, mostly Jews he's writing to, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. There are many people all across this land that believe in God. We already saw that number, 81%. But it's not going to save them unless they put their trust in Christ. See, we need to help people understand the facts of the gospel. That has to start. It starts maybe as a little child or sometime later in their life. And then they have to take that step and trust Christ. They can't just walk around Jesus and go, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. You know, I know he can hold me up. Oh, it looks really good. I'm going to go to church my whole life. I'm not going to trust him. No, they actually need to go go like this and trust Jesus totally to save them. Unfortunately, there are some false gospels out there that are saying, you you got to do your part, you got to work, so they kind of hold themselves up. They don't want to totally trust Jesus. They're like, I'm going to kind of do my part and make sure that I keep myself saved. That's not a true gospel. That's not good news. Jesus said, it's finished. The work of salvation is complete. He did the whole work. And all you do is sit in the chair, trust in him alone. See, it's unfortunate that there are different gospels out there. They're saying, well, you've got to clean up your life first. I remember a few weeks ago, I dressed in a suit and then took the suit, parts of the suit off to say, some people think you got to clean up your life before we come to Jesus. That's not the case. <laughs> How clean do you have to be? You come as you are. The gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Jesus came from heaven to earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross, rose again, and offers that to anyone who believes. Anyone. Romans 1.16, Paul says this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. And that word believe means to rest, like sitting in a chair. It means to trust, like realizing that, you know what, I can't do anything to earn my salvation. I can't do one thing. I accept what he did for me, 100%, 100%. You see, when you come to faith in Jesus, that is a game changer. When you come to true faith in Jesus, he removes the mountain of sin that's in your life. Colossians says he forgives us all our sins, all of them. Well, not some, and then you got to work to cover the rest. No, all of them, and we live in light of that. That's insane. John 14, 6, Jesus was saying this to his disciples. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. There's no other name. He is the only one. That's what saving faith is. Intellectual faith, you know the facts of the gospel. Saving faith is you put your total trust in Jesus to save you. In Romans 3.28 It says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Apart from the works of the law. Romans 8.1 tells us that when you come to faith in Christ, there is now no condemnation. All your sins are gone. Now we live in light of that. Here's the challenge because I've seen this in different churches I've been in. People attend church. They think because they go to church, they're a Christian, or because they were raised in a Christian home, they're a Christian. That's just like walking in a garage thinking you're a car because you went into a garage. It's not going to make you a Christian just because you came into a church. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this. Says this. He's writing to a church that he started that... Gave him such a challenge, and he says to them, Examine yourselves 
to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So here's a test for you. Who are you trusting to get you into heaven? If you say, well, Jesus and what I do, that's the wrong answer. It's not Jesus plus you or Jesus plus church or Jesus plus my works or Jesus plus everything else. I'm doing. No, it's Jesus alone. He said no one but him can get you there. No one. Christ alone, just like my shirt says, right here. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. That's it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's why it's such good news. You know, saving faith is someone putting their total trust in Christ, but it, God doesn't want us to stop there. He doesn't. He wants us to move on. You see, salvation is a free gift, but discipleship, following Jesus, will cost you everything. Just think about that. Jesus wants us to die to self and live for him. Die daily. That's discipleship. That's being a follower. And God desires for his disciples, his followers, to be mature. And we know, if we're honest, we're works in progress. And some of you go, oh, yeah, we know you are, Pastor Ken. Yeah, I am. That's my wife. But the next type of faith is the faith. It's used in the New Testament with the article in front of it, the faith referring to doctrinal statements. Doctrinal statements, statements of belief. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us that pastors are to equip the believer so that they can grow to maturity in Christ. This is what can keep us from growing to maturity in Christ. Let's read this. Ephesians 4, verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants and tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. False teaching can keep Christians from growing to maturity. And this is, the, this is the responsibility of the body. Look at verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. We have an obligation to one another to speak the truth in love. There have been so many people in my life that have seen things and spoken the truth in love to me. And at the time, I'm telling you, I wasn't real excited about it. But afterwards, I thought, wow, they cared enough to love me and tell me the truth. Everybody loves babies, right? My wife loves babies. And yet, you don't want a 30-year-old living in the basement acting like a baby. You don't. Then the parents go, well, you know, we'll keep doing his wash and making sure. No, kick him out. It's time. Well past time. He needs to grow up. Time to grow up. And so we need to help baby Christians to grow up, not to stay where they are. They need to grow not to judge them, but to help them grow. That's our responsibility as a church. But we also need, as a church, to be watching out for false doctrine. Doctrines that go against what Scripture says. So, 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul says this. The, clear, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, and he started, this started in Paul's day, around 40 A.D., all the way to today, that in latter times, some will abandon the faith. They'll walk away from the clear teaching of Scripture and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. You go, no, that won't happen to a true Christian. Absolutely, it could. It happened in Paul's day. It still happens today. I had a friend a number of years ago. Came to Christ, was really following after God, and he seemed to be really learning the scriptures and following, and he moved away from upstate New York out west. 
And he called his family and he said, oh yeah, by the way, I became a Mormon. And we're like, what? (laughs) They don't believe the way we believe, just in case you didn't know that. They don't see Jesus as God. They think you've got to work your way to heaven. Titus chapter 1, verse 13. In the pastoral epistles alone, this phrase, the faith, is used nine times because Paul is concerned that the churches that he started and Titus was going to watch over and Timothy was going to watch over would stay true to the faith, the doctrines. The saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. He's talking about people within the church that are going astray from true doctrine so that they will be sound in the faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like it when I'm sick. Last weekend, I got a little cold, and I'm thinking, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to call Jeff and tell him, you know, I can't, I can't make it Sunday. You know, when you get sick, you just don't feel right. This word, sound, is the word for healthy, healthy in the faith. God wants us to be healthy in the faith. And how do we do that? We get back into the word. We study the scriptures. We read the word. We listen to it. Put yourself in places where you can hear the Bible. Hear Life Group Wednesday night. We're starting a new series. What's it called? Undefendable? Is that right? And it's, it's really a relationship type thing, right? Am I getting that right? Jeff's organizing this, so, you know, I don't know everything that goes on at church, which is a good thing. Can't do that. But put yourself in a place where you can hear God's word. The U version has an app. It has an app. You can just load it into your phone and listen to the New Testament or even the whole Bible. It's really amazing. First John chapter 2 tells us that in any church, any healthy, growing church, there's going to be different groups, different groups within the church. And he says this, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. There are baby Christians in our church, and that's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. It's a sign of life. But all they know is, I'm saved. (laughs) My sins are forgiven. (laughs) I know the Father. (laughs) That's great. I write to you, fathers. Now he's talking to a different group. Because you know him who is from the beginning. These are the mature believers within a church that say, you know what? I've had major storms in my life, and God's going to see me through it because I trust him. I write to you, young men, he's referring to those who know God's word. Listen, because you are strong, the word of God lives in you, and you've overcome the evil one. The evil one sends all these false doctrines into the world, and those who are young men, young men and women in the faith who go, no, 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 that's not right. The Bible says this, that's not right. Here's what it says. So where are you? Where are you in this category? Are you a baby where you got a noise on one end and a mess on the other? (laughs) Don't let people be always bailing you out. Figure out a way to grow, to get to maturity by reading the word and putting yourself in a place where you're getting God's word in your life. Maybe you need to ask somebody to help you, to mentor you. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for people in my life at the very beginning of the stages of my Christian life who mentored me and discipled me and said, (laughs) you got to work on that attitude. you got to work on this. Here's an interesting thing. If you have children, guess what? You get to disciple them. That's amazing. You get to pour your life into them and teach them God's word. Or as grandparents, this is even way more fun. We have five grandkids. We spent some time with some of them yesterday, and it was so much fun. But they're always watching us. And we want to have an influence on them for the kingdom and for eternity. Amazing thing. So you have intellectual faith. You have saving faith. You also have the faith, the doctrines or teachings, but also there is the living faith, the concept of living faith, living out your faith, not just knowing what you should be doing, but living it out. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says this, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, 
a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Think about that. You, when you come to faith in Christ first, you receive the righteousness of God. Totally. <laughs> You're totally righteous. You're in Christ. You're a righteous dude. So that was bad. <laughs> I just watched the Jesus Revolution again last night, okay? So he said that. But then it says here, As it is written, the righteous, referring to the believer, will live by faith. Will live by faith. 2 Corinthians tells us we live by faith, not by sight. I mean, think about it. You're here gathering, and we're praising and worshiping someone we really haven't seen yet. We're looking into the book that he gave us. We're trusting that he's going to teach us through his word. That's all faith. That's amazing. You're praying for other people when they have troubles. That's faith. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. And by the way, in Paul's letters, he tells us what the sign of a healthy church is. It is not ABC. It's not attendance, buildings, and cash. A lot of people think it is. It's not. It's faith, hope, and love. Because any size church that's growing to maturity can show faith, hope, and love. Look at, listen to what he says in 1 Thessalonians 1.3. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about this. If you are a true believer, you have sat in the chair, you're trusting Jesus, there should be some work that results out of that. Not to save you, not to keep you saved, but a product of your faith. So is your faith active or is it dead? Works really, in this case, are a supernatural result of the Holy Spirit working through us. James chapter 2 is often misunderstood. James chapter 2, verse 17, he says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead faith. He's talking to people who are making professions, and James is saying, If your faith is not seen by your works, people are going to think you're not really saved. Let's keep reading. James chapter 2, verse 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is dead? God doesn't need evidence. He sees genuine faith or not. Who needs the evidence? Yourself, other people around you. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So let's look at this illustration. He uses Abraham. It says about Abraham that he he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Genesis chapter 15. Isaac wasn't even born yet. Many years later, Isaac is born as a teenager, and God says to Abraham, now offer Isaac. And out of faith and obedience, he brings him to that altar. Of course, God stops him. But that was evidence that his faith in Genesis 15 was real. And I want to challenge you, if there's no evidence of a changed life, you need to come to Jesus. Just because you come to church doesn't make you saved. But if there's no evidence, you ought to be concerned. None of us are perfect, believe me. But God desires for us to live out our faith. And unfortunately, many churches across America have great doctrinal statements. And yet they have dead faith. There's no work produced by faith. When you think about this, we, we do these for the, project, for the city projects, and it's an awesome way for us as a church to work together. I think 
the more we do this, the more we can say to the community, we love you, we care about you, we want to bless you. In Hebrews 11.6, it says this, that without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Just think about that. God rewards those who earnestly seek him. How earnestly are you seeking him? Is the word of God your counselor? Is the Holy Spirit the one leading you and guiding you? The Bible tells us to stay in step with the Spirit. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to acknowledge God in all our ways. See, then we move from that, that living faith that God desires of us, but he also wants us to have great faith. And you go, well, sometimes my faith is really faltering. Sometimes my faith is really weak. I'm with you on that. The interesting thing, this is really interesting, if you study the word little faith in the Gospels, Jesus said that five times to his disciples. O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, ye of little faith, because they didn't believe him. There are only two times in the Gospels that Jesus commends people for great faith. And the crazy thing is, both were foreigners. A centurion, this is another centurion, a centurion who wanted Jesus to come and heal his servant and when Jesus started to approach, he said, look, don't come to my house. Just say the word. It'll be done. And he's like, wow, this guy has great faith. But we're going to read about a woman who was a foreigner, who Jesus intentionally goes to her town, I believe, for a divine appointment to meet her. Let's read this, Matthew chapter 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him. Now, the Canaanites, we know. What was the reputation of the Canaanites? What was the relationship between them and Israel? They were Israel's what? Enemies. She's crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. This is crazy. Jesus is testing her. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. I can imagine this. They're up in this town. They're sitting at a cafe, drinking a little coffee, you know, eating their lamb chops, you know, and disciples are going, Jesus, this lady's crazy. She's crying after us. Send her away. He answered in verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread, that's Jesus, he's the bread of life, and toss it to the dogs. That word, dog, was used of wild, ferocious dogs that would roam around, and you would have a stick to protect yourself. Wild dogs. I mean, we don't understand this. We have leash laws now. When I was a kid... There were no leash laws. And there were times I'd walk through a neighborhood and boom, a dog would go after me. I was little. Here he's referring to the idea of wild dogs. Jesus is like, are you one of those? Unbelievers, Gentiles, were seen as dogs. They were those who did not care about God and his word. Jesus said, don't give what is sacred. <laughs> The dogs, don't throw your word, the word of God, to somebody who doesn't care. And he's testing her. Verse 27, yes, it is, Lord. Yes, it's true. That's true, she said. Even the dogs, and she uses a different word. She uses the word for little house dog. She's like, even the little house dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. Unlike the disciples, which I can fall into that category, 
God wants us to have this kind of faith, great faith. Jesus had spent time on the mountain of transfiguration. He was with three disciples, Peter, James, and John. The Father spoke to him. He, the glory of God was there, and they, they saw the glory of God come through Jesus. They come down from the mountain, and a guy is trying to get the other nine disciples to cast a demon out of his son. They couldn't do it. Jesus says this to his disciples, you unbelieving and perverse generation, he replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Jesus gave his disciples authority to cast out demons. They just didn't believe. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. That word little means poverty. Their faith was bankrupt. They had no faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as size, faith as a mustard seed or as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Think about it. The mustard seed in Israel was the smallest seed in Israel tiny. It grew to be a plant, a bush in the garden of about 10 to 12 feet. And Jesus is saying, all you need is very tiny faith in the infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing God. So what kind of faith do you have? Do you have a faith like the disciples? Little faith? You're like, ah, I'm not sure God can do this. I don't know. Or are you ready for God to move mountains? Mountains in your life. What is it in your life right now? You're going, this is something that's huge in my life. And I really want God to show up. Then bring it to him. Bring it to him. You see, he wants every believer to have this kind of faith, mountain-moving faith. A little faith in the all-powerful, all, all all-knowing God. And that's how we make Jesus famous, through our faith. Maybe you're in this situation, maybe you're listening to my voice, and you have intellectual faith. You have a faith that you're looking at Jesus, and you're going, you know, I believe he is God. I believe he came to earth. I believe he lived the perfect life and died and rose again, but I'm not ready to trust him with my life. Why not? <laughs> Why not surrender and give your life to him and say, Jesus, I want you to save me. Save me. Romans 10, verse 11 says this. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. You won't trust in Christ and find that the chair, in a sense, collapses. <laughs> he will hold you up. He will take care of you. You won't be disappointed. But if you know Christ, are you more like the disciples that you lack faith? Why not say, Lord, here is the mountain in my life. I want to trust you with that. Let's have the band come up. I want you to be thinking about your own life. What is it that God wants you to do? Let's pray together. If you don't know Christ, don't wait. Don't keep putting it off. If you understand the gospel, if you understand that it's Jesus alone and he died for you, rose again, why not call out to him and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, forgive my sins, give me eternal life. The moment you ask, you won't be disappointed. He'll forgive all your sins. He said he'll never leave you. He'll be there with you forever. Tell someone. If you have done that, tell someone. For the believer, what's the mountain in your life? I want you to think about that. What is the mountain that you face? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a bad relationship that you're struggling with and don't even know how to handle it. Maybe it's financial debt. Maybe it's doubts that plague you. Whatever it is, whatever that mountain is, Jesus knows about it. 
He knows it. Just trust him. Give it over to him. Surrender it to him. He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Lord Jesus, thank you that as a church, we, we want to be that kind of church. We want to be a church that sees great things happen because we're believing you for great things. To bring you honor and glory, to make you famous. We want to see many people come to know you and churches planted and cool things happen because we believe you. God, use your word in our lives. There are things going on in us that you're not happy with. Convict us, show us. Those who need to be encouraged, Lord, encourage them, strengthen them, and we pray this in your name. Amen.